Are demographics still destiny? I'm Michael Smirconish in Philadelphia. I remember this well. It arrived with a thunderclap. January of 2008, Pew Research Center released a report titled U.S. Population Projections from 2005 to 2050. And the overview said this, if current trends continue, the demographic profile of the United States will change dramatically by the middle of the century. Among the projections that by 2050, the nation's racial and ethnic mix would look quite different than it did then. Non-Hispanic whites, who made up 67% of the population in 2005, were projected to be just 47% by 2050. And this was widely interpreted to be good news for one party. Demographics are the Democrats' best friend, or so thought many. In fact, in 2009, James Carville even wrote a book titled, 40 More Years, How Democrats Will Rule the Next Generation. But here we are 14 years later, and things might not be turning out as anticipated. In fact, Josh Krushauer from Axios is calling the new great realignment arguably the biggest political story of our time. Here's the latest data. If current trends continue, the U.S. population will rise to 404 million by 2060. The non-Hispanic white population is projected to shrink over that time by nearly 19 million. Now, non-Hispanic whites are projected to become a minority sooner than was anticipated by 2045. Previously, it was presumed that this was a huge threat to the Republican Party, which had not been doing well with minority voters. But this is no longer the case. Data from a recent Times Siena poll shows that although gaining support from college-educated white voters, the Democratic Party is losing support from minorities, specifically Hispanics, as well as the working class. As CNN's Harry Enten recently pointed out, Republicans are currently polling 10 points better with people of color than their previous best year, 2004. And Harry explains it this way. Part of why that's occurring is the changing demographic makeup of voters of color. They're a lot more Hispanic than they used to be. At the same time, they're a lot less black. Hispanic voters don't support Democrats as much as black voters. But that's not all that's going on. Democratic support from Asian American, black, and Hispanic voters is much lower than it has usually been. And what issues are driving this great realignment? The New York Times analysis summarizes them like this. Voters who said abortion, guns, or threats to democracy were the biggest problem facing the country backed Democrats by a wide margin as Republicans make new inroads among non-white and working-class voters who remain more concerned about the economy. You'll remember that last month in a special election in South Texas, in the heavily Hispanic, blue-leaning 34th Congressional District, it was Republican Myra Flores who flipped the first Democratic seat of the 2022 cycle. Axios's Crush Hour says the bottom line is this, the GOP is trading soccer moms for Walmart dads. Or put another way, gone are the days of country club Republicans, here are the days of country club Democrats. This whole discussion immediately brings to my mind Thomas Frank, the New York Times bestselling author who's been analyzing political trends for decades. He's written multiple books on the subject, including his latest, The People Know, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. It was in 2004 that Frank wrote his award-winning What's the Matter with Kansas? How Conservatives Won the Heart of America, in which he evaluates the question, why do the working people of Kansas historically vote for Republican candidates, even though supporting them seems against their interests? Thomas Frank joins me now. Thomas, thanks for coming back. Chicken and egg question for you. Did Trump bring this about in some way, or did this realignment give rise to Trump-like candidates? Now, by the way, hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on. I would say this process has been going on for a long time, for my entire lifetime, but Trump has certainly accelerated it. I should say, I, you know, I come from a part of, I grew up in a part of the state of Kansas that's closely identified with country club republicanism. I'm, I'm referring to Johnson County, Kansas, which is the affluent suburbs of Kansas City. And when I was a kid, this I thought this was the most Republican place in the world. And it, you know, it was at the time. And uh, it just flipped for Joe Biden in, uh, in 2020. Um, kind of an amazing story. But that's happening in affluent suburbs all over America. So is it an American phenomena or is this a global phenomena? I'm thinking Brexit may have something to do with it. 
Oh my God, yeah, it, it, is, it is global now, but it's been going on longer in this country. Look, the, the beginning of all this, as with so many of the things that, we, that we're still fighting with here and fighting over here in America, be, it be, all begins in the late 1960s when you basically have the Democratic Party in a civil war, you know, fighting with themselves over, over Vietnam, over civil rights issues. And at some point they decided they did not, they no longer wanted to be the party of organized labor. They basically wanted to turn their backs on the white working class and the New Deal. And it took them um, years to finally do this, but they, they, along the way they developed a new sort of understanding of themselves that they were going to be a party of what they call, what was it, the term that they like to use, the wired workers or the learning class. They were going to be a party of affluent white collar professionals and also of, uh, you know, of minorities, of the people you were talking about. The problem with this uh, theory is it leads them to this, like, this sort of incredible complacency when dealing with these voters. You know, they, uh, back in the Clinton years, they used to always say those people have nowhere else to go, right? So they could do whatever they right. wanted. They didn't have to, you know, they didn't have to actually get anything done on these voters' behalf. They didn't have to deliver anything. The people that they really had to worry about were those, you know, affluent suburban professionals. Those are the ones they had to care about. And it, it, it assumes that the Republicans, you know, are going to are never going to do actually do anything to reach out to these people, but that that's an incorrect assumption. The, you know, the Republican Party, they're smart people, uh, they're dynamic. You know, they're constantly coming up with new ways of reaching out to these people. You asked about, uh, you know, uh, is it a worldwide phenomenon? It absolutely is. We were uh, America was ahead of the rest of the world in this regard of the party of the left reaching out to and becoming a party of um, affluent white collar uh, voters. But you see that now in France, uh, you see it in Britain, uh, you see it in Germany, you see it in Australia. You, well, you basically see it everywhere in the, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the Western world, everywhere that I know. Thomas, of. can I, can I ask you a quote from one of my favorite quotes from What's the Matter with Kansas? I'll give the short version. Out here, the gravity of discontent pull only in one direction, to the right, to the right, and further to the right. Why? Why is that the case? The Republican Party saw their opportunity. Look, when the Democrats became this sort of, um, you know, made their outreach to affluent voters, to, you know, uh, to, to affluent white collar professionals, the Republican Party said, look what they're doing. This is back right. in the Richard Nixon days. They said, look what they're doing. They're abandoning the most important, you know, voting block in American life, which is working class people. In those days, the white working class, but now it's obviously expanded. And they developed all of these very in ingenious ways of reaching out and winning over those voters and speaking to their discontent. They used to have a saying back in the 1970s. This is the right wing, by the way. The Repu right wing of the Republican Party had a saying, organize discontent organized discontent. It sounds like something you'd hear from, you know, from radical farmers in the 1890s. But no, that is the Republican Party that believes can in I, organizing can I discontent. Say, can I say that Ron Brownstein, for whom I have the utmost respect, and Catherine put it up on the screen, wrote about this subject in The Atlantic, essentially saying, hey, not so fast, just one data point. He says, even though the major data sources all show that Trump carried only about one-fourth of non-white voters without a college degree in 2020, Biden actually carried a notably higher share of white voters without a college degree. So it's, it's not as if the shift is complete. My final question for you is, take 30 yeah. seconds and tell me, where are we going? Oh. So look, Biden was, uh, in a lot of ways, Biden was a hopeful sign. Uh, uh, you know, Biden, uh, uh, middle class Joe, you know, uh, comes from Scranton, has those roots. But I'm afraid uh, that, and, and people were willing to listen to Biden. And, and, and in some ways he did, you know, slightly reverse this, put this phenomenon into reverse. But I'm, I'm afraid that he hasn't really uh, delivered on a lot of the things that we expected him to. And I'm very, look, I was very hopeful. <laughs> I was hopeful about Biden. I was even more hopeful about Barack Obama back in 2008. But, you know, when these guys uh, keep dropping the ball, you know, it, it, it allows the Republicans to, to do it again, to, to, uh, to organize discontent one more time. They're very, very, very good at it. I don't think Thomas, it's Thomas, thank end you so well, much for Michael. being here. It doesn't My end pleasure. well, is, is what I hear you saying. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate your, your time.